Okay. Um, well, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Chen Jinghua for inviting me here to UBC. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. I hope I can see more of it during my short stay here. And I also like to thank Vicky Baker for making all of my arrangements for being here. So thank you very much, and to everyone for taking time out of your busy day to come and hear me speak a little bit about the topic of on the visual culture of Buddhist models at Dunhuang. And as Professor Chen mentioned, uh, this um, presents one portion of my book, um, uh, which really addresses um, how to look at Buddhist mandalas um, from the perspective of visual culture, that is, how to deal with them um, on the basis of their visuality rather than strictly for uh, the role that they played in Buddhist rituals. And in doing so, I think that we complicate some of the narratives about um, the Silk Road. And what I'm presenting to you here on the screen before you are three narratives uh, regarding the Silk Road, what the Silk Road was when it was established. And the first of which is um, uh, Baron Ferdinand von Richthofen, who was the first scholar to coin the term Silk Road um, in 1877. And then the second of which uh, presents the Chinese diplomat uh, Zhang Qian, who uh, it is said opened up the Silk Road um, uh, going into the Western regions during the Western Han Dynasty in order to seek assistance from Central Asian tribes against the Xiongnu. And then more recently, a few years ago, there was a study published in the journal Nature uh, by a group of scholars from Washington University regarding the uh, role that nomads played in opening up what eventually became the sort of long distance trade routes uh, that Richthofen wrote about. Uh, and this study demonstrated that um, up to 75% of the ancient Silk Road sites um, s were uh, initially uh, connected through uh, the movements of nomads um, who moved herds to and from Pine Mountain Meadows. Um, what all three, three models have in common is that they articulate a view of the Silk Road that rests very much on long-range travel um, and transmission, and particularly in an east-west view of cultural transmission. So in my talk today, what I'm interested in is actually the sustained context between two populations, um, especially the Mogao Kays in Dunhuang. And we can see Dunhuang on the map right here. And then in the lower right, what you see is a view of the facade of the caves um, at the northern end of um, the site. And Dunhuang was a site that was first established in the 2nd century uh, BC as a military garrison by the Han Dynasty. Um, this was China's gateway uh, to the um, western regions, to the Silk Roots. Um, the Mokau cave sites um, flourished between the 4th to 14th centuries. And uh, this is comprised of 735 caves. They were carved into the eastern side of Mingsha Mountain. And the portion that you see here in the lower right are the roughly 200 caves in the northern end. Um, these were mostly undecorated. These were used for the habitation of monks uh, who resided and stayed at the site. And then to the south, there were uh, another 492 caves, and those were the ones that were installed with mural paintings as well as with clay statues. So one primary material that we'll use um, are mural paintings from the Mogao Caves at Dunhuang. And it is at the Mogao Caves that, um, and other Buddhist sites at Dunhuang, that we see evidence of long-term interactions between um, two populations, uh, the Chinese during the Tang Dynasty and the Tibetans. And so what I'm interested in um, by using these materials from Dunhuang then are long-term uh, contacts between two populations rather than long-range transmission. Um, as you saw in the earlier slide, the three views of the Silk Road that I explained to you. Um, the practice of carving rock-cut cave shrines from the mountainsides um, first began in India, and what I'm showing you here is a view of the Ajanta Caves, um, which similarly also has um, sculptures as well as paintings. And then in addition to the evidence from uh, mural paintings from cave sites, we're also going to look at portable objects from Dunhuang. And then on the left, what you see is a view of Mokau Cave 16. And Mokau Cave 16 gives us a rather um, a standard view of a classic cave shrine um, and that we have an open space. Um, this is an antechamber. This is the main chamber of the cave shrine. Uh, we have an altar on top of which are icons, Buddhist icons uh, modeled out of clay. Um, in many cases, in many caves, um, some of the original statues were destroyed and then replaced with reconstructed images uh, dating from the Qing Dynasty. And what I want to draw your attention to is a small doorway on the right side um, in the um, corridor leading to the main chamber of Cave 16. 
And uh, this is number 17, and this is a so-called library cave of Dunhuang, the Dunhuang Library Cave. And it was in this cave that over 60,000 manuscripts and portable paintings uh, were sealed up inside this cave uh, sometime in the early 11th century. And this also comprises an important body of material for our understanding of cross-cultural interactions. Again, long-term uh, cross-cultural interactions uh, between populations living close proximity to one another. And these manuscripts were discovered by uh, Taoist priests, uh, Wang Yanlu or Abbot Wang, um, and then subsequently sold uh, many of them sold to uh, various collections um, uh, discovered by explorers in the early 20th century. So the largest overseas collections of the Dunhuang materials are now the Stein Collection um, in the British Library and British Museum, and also the Paleo Collections in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and Musée Guimet. So we'll be looking at some of those materials as well. Um, so let's take a look at the chronology of this region. And if we take a step back, what's interesting about um, the long-term sustained interactions between the Chinese and the Tibetans is that uh, the Tang Empire and the Tibetan Empire um, developed really side by side um, with one another. Um, and they seem to comprise a parallel chronology. Um, so the dates of the Tang uh, Dynasty China are 618 to 907, and these overlap uh, very closely with the dates of the Tibetan Empire between 600 to 850. Uh, between the years 786 to 848, the Tibetans occupied Dunhuang. And then, in the mid-9th century, the Tibetans were um, expelled from Dunhuang um, under the leadership of someone who um, I'll come back to, uh, the Chinese military general named uh, Zhang Yichao. And then between the years 848 to 1036, um, marks the period of rule under the military governors of the Return to Allegiance Army, or the Gui Yichun. And um, it's important to keep in mind that this chronology is quite specific uh, to Dunhuang. Uh, so according to standard Chinese chronology, standard Chinese dynastic chronology, the Tibetan occupation of Dunhuang is called the, uh, middle, uh, the uh, Mid-Tang Dynasty. And then the period during which the Return to Allegiance Army rules is called the Late Tang Dynasty. And so by using this terminology, uh, the Tibetan occupation period or the return to allegiance army period, uh, we're really paying close attention to the particulars of um, the historical context um, of this region. And then going back to the parallel circumstances of the Tang Empire and the Tibetan Empire, the return to allegiance army, in particular this period um, the mid-9th century, also coincides with the fragmentation of the Tibetan Empire. And the fragmentation of the Tibetan Empire uh, was precipitated by a series of secession crises um, in the mid-9th century. And then after that, overlapping directly with the return to allegiance army, uh, there was no central religious or political authority in Tibet until the second transmission of Buddhism to Tibet, and this began during the late 10th century. And so I hypothesized in my book that um, since there was a great deal of independence, uh, during the Return to Allegiance Army period, that is a great deal of independence from the Tang Chinese court at Chang'an, and at the same time, there's a great deal of independence on the part of the Tibetans as well, because there was no central political religious authority, um, that this very likely led to religious as well as artistic innovations during this period. And another thing that I want to point out is that um, even after uh, Dunhuang was returned, um, quote unquote, returned to the central Chinese court at Chang'an um, in the mid 9th century, that the Tibetan presence continued to um, uh, continued on um, in Central Asia. And we see this in a number of different ways. So, for example, the system of monastic administration that began during the Tibetan period um, continued even during the Gui Yichun and Return to Allegiance Army period. And we also see evidence of the continued use of Tibetan, um, the Tibetan script as a means of communication, uh, both between the rulers of the Kuei and other Central Asian peoples, and also among Central Asian peoples themselves, um, because uh, Tibetan is a syllabary, and so could be adapted to write languages other than Tibetan. And then, as I'll demonstrate in today's talk, we also see the continuation of certain iconographic templates and artistic styles as well. And these are artistic styles and iconographic templates that were first introduced to the Dunhuang region during the Tibetan occupation of Dunhuang, and then that continued into the Gui period. And uh, while we're still on this map, I also want to point out to you not only the location of Dunhuang and the Mokau Caves, 
uh, but also of nearby Anxi and then the Yilin Caves. Um, so you see the two cave sites that we'll talk about, the two Buddhist cave sites marked by the black square. So the Mokau cave, si cave shrines to the west and then the Yilin Cave shrines uh, located slightly to the east. Um, so let me continue by introducing this iconographic template to you and our focus today will be the Mandala of Eight Great Bodhisattvas. And this is a painting that was originally from the library cave at Dunhuang and then um, discovered uh, by Oral Stein on his expeditions and this is now in the British Museum. So this is actually a, a fairly well-known painting. And this dates to the Tibetan period. Um, it's actually a fairly small painting. This is surprising, especially uh, for anyone who has studied um, East Asian art or Buddhist art and has seen images of the monumental uh, Two Realms mandala in the Xinguan tradition, which are very, very large paintings. And I think the reason for this is that within the religious culture of Dunhuang, um, mandalas such as these were commissioned not for large-scale monastic ceremonies of the type that we normally associate with the Japanese Shinguan mandalas, um, but rather they're often commissioned for um, private ceremonies, um, uh, commissioned on the part of lay people. And so for that reason, we often see lay donors uh, not only accompanying mural paintings in the cave shrines, um, but also in the portable paintings themselves. And so the main characteristics of the Mandala of Eight Great Bodhisattvas are, first of all, the central deity. And the central deity can vary um, according to the specific image, but in this case, this is the central deity of uh, uh, Virakshana Buddha. And Virakshana Buddha is attended on either side by eight attendant deities, and these are known as Bodhisattvas in the Buddhist tradition. So there are four on the left side and four on the right side. And other important characteristics of this type of imagery is that the Buddha is crowned. Um, so this is somewhat unusual. We normally don't associate images of the Buddha with um, this type of lavish adornment. Um, but the Buddha is crowned, um, assumes a gesture of meditation in which the two hands are brought forward, and is seated on a lotus pedestal. And then um, down below, it's large to see, but normally there are, should be two lions um, in the base of the pedestal. And uh, another thing I want to point out, and this also confirms the dating of this painting to the Tibetan period, is that um, you'll notice square, um, or I should say rectangular cartouches. Uh, these, um, one over here, one over here, over here, and there are others accompanying the other deities. And you'll also note that they are horizontally oriented. And this is because they're originally intended for the writing in of Tibetan inscriptions rather than Chinese, which of course is written vertically from right to left. And some of these Tibetan inscriptions are remaining. And this is something that I want to point out to you because we'll see other variations um, accompanying yet other paintings in which the cartouches were oriented in such a way in order to accommodate not only Tibetan script, but Chinese script as well. Uh, let's see here. Okay. And in addition to the portable painting, we also see other large-scale examples of the Mandala of Eight Great Bodhisattvas um, from culturally Tibetan regions. And here I'm going to talk a little bit more about the significance of the Eight Bodhisattva Mandala, um, especially during a period, again, of long-term long uh, sustained contacts between the Tibetans and the Chinese. And this is one monumental uh, rock carving. So this is about four meters tall, and there are two figures in the foreground to give you a sense of scale. And in this, the figures are oriented in a similar way to the painting that you saw previously. Uh, in the center, we have Vairokshana Buddha. He is once again crowned. And then there are two lines. We can see this a little more clearly here in the carving as opposed to the dark painting in the previous slide. So there are two lions in the base. And there are likewise four bodhisattvas on either side. So these four attendant deities. And what is particularly interesting about this particular mandala is that uh, there is a dedicatory inscription and it attests to the commissioning of this particular rock carving by the Tibetan abbot uh, Yeshe Yang. And the sculpture was made in the year 816 and it was intended for the spiritual benefit of the sovereign temple. This is the Tibetan king and the prosperity of all sentient beings. And not only that, but the reason for the precise timing of this commission, the year 816, uh, was because this was meant to mark the beginning of treaty negotiations between the Tang Empire and uh, the Tibetan Empire. And these were treaty uh, negotiations that culminated in the signing of the last of the treaties that was signed between the Chinese and Tibetans during the Tang Dynasty. And this um, was finalized in the year 821-822. And in addition to that, the inscription also names um, the Tibetan ministers who were in charge of the negotiations on behalf of the, of the Tibetan Empire. 
and also the Tibetan and Chinese craftsmen who jointly executed the work. Um, so we're really fortunate to have this inscription because it gives us a lot of information, not only about the historical circumstances uh, behind this particular um, mandala, but also about the artisans who collaborated on this work. Um, Ye Shiyang is an interesting figure for our purposes because he was the abbot of uh, Triga Monastery in um, present-day Qinghai province. And this seemed to be a center for a cult of Vairokshana, again, the central deity of this mandala. And it seems that during uh, the Tibetan period, uh, Vairokshana took on special resonance um, as a symbol of the Tibetan Empire, um, of the Tibetan Emperor, and this would echo similar associations of royal authority with Varakshana Buddha elsewhere in East Asia. So, for example, in Tang China and then also in Japan as well. Um, another interesting uh, fact about Triga Monastery is that um, it was highly connected with Jinhuang, uh, with monasteries in Sichuan, and also with Lhasa as well. And so we see, for example, among the uh, Jinhuang manuscripts, uh, there are some manuscripts at Dunhuang that preserve parts of the monastic syllabus of Triga Monastery. And then there are others that confirms communication with monasteries in Sichuan. And likewise, there were texts that originated in this particular monastery, in Yesha Yang's monastery, that were also circulated to um, Lhasa and to um, other uh, Tibetan monasteries um, in Tibetan regions. And so this really speaks to um, sort of a series of very localized networks uh, through which the cult of Vairokshana and the Mall of Eight Great Bodhisattvas was transmitted. Okay. Now, going back to the idea of treaty negotiations between the Italian Chinese and the Tibetans, uh, what I'm showing you on the right is a painting. Now, this is a mural painting from Yilin Cave 25, also Tibetan period. And we can see that it's very similar to the painting that I showed you earlier on the left, and that we similarly have Vairokshana Buddha in the center. Uh, with a crown, wearing a very elaborate crown, and also with hands in a gesture of meditation. And a little bit hard to see in the mural painting, but there are also lions um, in the base of the pedestal. And here the main difference is that the bodhisattvas are now oriented in two rows on either side of the Buddha, um, two rows and two columns on either side of Buddha, rather than in two columns on either side of the Buddha. And this is a painting um, inside a cave uh, which the scholar uh, Matthew Capsians argued might have been a temple that was erected in order to commemorate the very same treaty negotiations that the rock carving I showed you in the previous slide were similarly meant to commemorate. So when we take a look at the uh, various treaties that were signed between the Tang and Tibetan empires, uh, there were seven altogether uh, that were negotiated between the years 706 and 822. You can see them over here. And these largely concerned um, really territorial negotiations. And um, the interactions between the Tang Chinese and Tibetans were very distinct from the interactions that the Tang Chinese had with other Central Asian peoples in that their relations were not based primarily on trade, um, as they were, for example, with the Sogdians or Uyghurs, um, but rather um, they were really dictated by um, territorial expansion and particularly the territorial expansion of the Tibetan Empire into Central Asia and into the borders of the Chinese territory, um, especially the region of Dunhuang and Anxi. Um, so this is something that, again, challenges our notions of the Silk Road um, as resting upon long-term, uh, long-distance trade routes um, stretching from east to west. And um, of these treaties, the treaty, the last one that was signed, uh, that was finalized in the year 821 and 822, uh, was quite distinct because um, from the other treaties, because this was a treaty that seemed to signal um, a greater sense of, um, it seemed to have been carried out with greater ceremony than the previous treaty negotiations. And it was also something that really placed emphasis on the sovereignty of China to the east and the sovereignty of Tibet in the west. And this conceptualization is something that was recorded um, in both the Chinese and Tibetan language treaty texts. And by signing this treaty, uh, the Tang Chinese and the Tibetans were able to come to terms with really what had been sort of back and forth control um, of territories in the Tarn Basin and Central Asia. Um, 
and this sort of back and forth had, had um, stretched all the way back to the early 8th century uh, with various periods of weakness or strength on both sides. So the Anlusham Rebellion, of course, was a low point for the Tang uh, dynasty. And so with the signing of this treaty, um, the two states were more or less uh, viewed each other um, as being on equal footing. Okay. Uh, so going back to the Temple of the Treaty argument, so according to um, scholarship carried out by Matthew Kapstein, um, he studied two Tibetan language manuscripts um, from the library cave at Dinhuang. And in these manuscripts, um, there's a description of a temple that was built specifically to commemorate, commemorate these treaty negotiations of 816 to 821, 822. And what is interesting about the uh, description of the temple of the treaty was that the iconographic program mirrors um, almost exactly the iconographic program of Yiling Cave 25. So not only the eight great bodhisattva mandla, which really sort of took center stage in the iconographic program, but many other motifs in the cave as well. Uh, more recently, he suggested that um, this might be either an imitation, that is, Yiling Cave 25 might actually have been um, an antecedent of the Temple of the Treaty, um, for various reasons, I think that Yulin Cave 25 might actually be an imitation of the original temple for the treaty. And the main reason for this would be that the most important temples um, in Tibet were always freestanding temples uh, rather than cave shrines or rock carvings. And the timing of this then, the construction of the temple, the treaty, and also the sighting of Yulin Cave 25 in what is essentially an eastern Tibetan territory, um, as opposed to, say, Lhasa, which is considered central Tibet, um, coincides with yet another project um, that was also meant to bring together the Chinese and, and Tibetan communities um, in the Dunhuang region and commemorate the Tibetan Empire. And this was a sutra copying project that was carried out between the 820s and the 840s. And this was carried out at Dunhuang. Um, the work was carried out, it seems, under Chinese scribes. And um, in the Sutra copying project, uh, many copies of um, various sutras were copied out in Tibetan as a way of commemorating and honoring uh, the then Tibetan emperor. And what I want to draw attention to before I move on is that in this mural painting, so this is on the rear wall of Yilin Cave 25, we have cartouches, once again, for the identification of the various deities of the mandala. And um, if you take a closer look, you'll notice that we have not only the horizontal cartouches, um, but vertical ones as well. And this um, suggests that these were intended originally for um, the copying of Tibetan and Chinese inscriptions. So this is a close-up detail of one of those cartouches. Uh, this is to the left side of the Buddha, and here we can see only Chinese script. And it identifies the uh, central deity as uh, Vairokshana Buddha, so the Dharmakaya Vairokshana Buddha. And in this cave, um, it seems as if the Tibetan uh, cartouches were never filled in for reasons that we don't, for which we, sh we don't fully understand. We don't really have an explanation for that, and that only the Chinese ones were filled in. Um, other caves um, at the Mokau site similarly have T-shaped cartouches uh, for the writing of Tibetan and Chinese inscriptions. These are Mokau caves 365, 75, and 251. And so this was a not entirely uncommon practice, generally speaking, at Dunhuang. So now that we've talked about um, the inscriptions um, and also the practice of using T-shaped cartouches in order to accommodate Tibetan and Chinese script, what I want to move on to is to talk a little bit about artistic style. And here we're sort of um, moving in maybe um, more into an art historical analysis um, rather than a buddhological analysis of the mandalas. And I'm trying to get a sense of um, um, how this, uh, the appropriation and the adoption of different types of visual languages might have been important um, within this multicultural environment. And what I'm doing in the slide is comparing a classic um, Tang Dynasty portable painting from Dunhuang on the left to the model of a great, a great bodhisattvas that you just saw on the right in order to illustrate what I mean by Tang Chinese style, which is what you see on the left, and uh, a Tibetan or Himalayan style, which is right, what you see on the right. And it largely rests on a number of factors. Um, so first of all, the articulation of the body. Uh, so in the Tang Chinese style, uh, we can see that the body is very round, so the face is very round. Um, the body is also very round and also somewhat stocky. 
And this is in contrast to the uh, Tibetan or Himalayan style handling of the Buddha on the right, in which the face is more oval than round and the body is elongated. And the shoulders are very broad and narrowed down to um, a very slender waist. Um, there are also other differences between the Tal and Shines and Tibetan styles, which rest upon the ornamentation and the style of dress of the Buddhas. So we can see that in the image on the right, the Buddha's body is more exposed. This is precisely what allows us to see the um, uh, articulation of the body. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the Buddha in the right is wearing a tall crown, uh, whereas in the classic Tan Chinese example on the left, um, the Buddha's body is unadorned. Okay. Um, in this slide, um, a comparison of a Tibetan period painting of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara on the right um, to a 9th century Nepalese painting on the left um, allows us to make further comparisons and to get a better sense of um, the Himalayan or Tibetan style. And again, what we see here is that um, the faces are both um, oval rather than round, and the body is elongated um, with very broad shoulders, um, a broad chest, and then narrowing down to a slender waist. Um, there are other examples of paintings of this type from Dunhuang um, of Bodhisattvas from the Tibetan period, and some of them also bearing uh, Tibetan inscriptions. And um, going back to the Nepalese statue on the left, um, the comparison between Nepalese and Tibetan period works at Dunhuang is no accident, um, as we um, have knowledge from historical sources of the contribution of Nepalese artists to Tibetan art. Um, and so, for example, uh, we know that there was a Nepalese presence, Nepalese population lost as early as the 7th century. And during the 8th century, we also have knowledge of uh, the uh, presence of Tibetan artists, um, Nepalese artists, excuse me, in Tibet, um, especially in the construction of uh, the earliest Tibetan monastery, Buddhist monastery, which is Samya Monastery. And this is what I'm showing you in this slide. Uh, according to Tibetan historical accounts, um, we have knowledge of uh, the Nepalese and Tibetan artists who worked side by side in the construction of Samya Monastery. Um, furthermore, the work of Nepalese artists at other Buddhist temples um, in the Tibetan Empire is also recorded. And not only was there significant interaction uh, between Nepalese and Tibetan artists, but uh, historical sources also note similar interactions between Tibetan, Indian, and Chinese artists as well. And it is said, for example, that the three stories of the main building of Samya, uh, the first Buddhist monastery in Tibet, were each said to have been constructed in the Tibetan, Chinese, and Indian styles by craftsmen from each of the respective regions. And um, it should come as no surprise that the main icon of the top floor was an image of Vairokshana surrounded by the eight bodhisattvas, similar to what we've seen so far in mural paintings, on the pearl bill painting, and also in the uh, rock carving. And so what this suggests to us is that even at this very early stage of history in Tibetan historical accounts, that um, there were clear distinctions that were made uh, between regional artistic styles, um, as well as um, acknowledgement of the contribution of these artistic styles to the development of uh, Buddhist visuality in early Tibet. Okay. And the intermingling of Tibetan and Chinese um, artistic styles and iconography um, uh, takes on a more complex form in Mokau Cave 156, and this dates to the second half of the 9th century. And it's a little bit difficult to pin down the pattern of this cave um, due to different dedicatory inscriptions that are found within it. Uh, but we do know that this must have been sponsored by the family of Zhang Yichao. And Zhang Yichao was a military governor um, who um, is credited with having defeated the Tibetans in 848. And what I'm showing you is a painting on the south wall of the cave. Uh, so if you were to walk into the cave, this would be on your left-hand side. And this is a very famous painting of the procession of Zhang Yichao. And I'm referring specifically to this painting that runs along the bottom edge of the wall. And here you can see um, banners and pennants flying and um, soldiers on horseback. Uh, there are musicians and dancers and onlookers in this painting as well. And the inscription of the painting tells us that um, this is a picture of the procession of Zhang Yichao 
military governor of Hushi, uh, acting minister of works and concurrent censor in chief, and his assembled troops expelling the Tibetan occupation and recovering the Hushi territory. So here, um, the message of the painting is unmistakably clear. Um, so this is a picture of a triumphant procession of, and of the reclaiming of the Hushi territory by the military governor, Zhang Yichao. Uh, the painting directly opposite also reinforces this message, and this is the painting that you would see on your right side um, as you enter the shrine, and this is a painting of the procession of Zhang Yichao's consort named Lady Sung. And here we do not see uh, warriors uh, riding a horse, but rather what we see are um, ladies uh, walking and then um, uh, people draw, uh, um, pulling carriages, and the idea behind this painting is that with the conquest and the reclaiming of the Hishi territory complete, um, this particular painting commemorates now the domestication of that territory. Um, so defeating the enemy and then kind of moving in, moving all your stuff in. <laughs> and the inscription attached to this painting says that this is the picture of the excursion of Lady Sung um, of Hunei province in the state of Sung. Um, so the mural paintings on opposite walls on north and south sides share themes of conquest and domestication. Um, so we begin with the visual commemoration of Zhang Yichao's triumphal reclamation of the recovered territory by grand military procession, after which his consort Lady Song follows in this painting in order to settle the pacified region, the newly pacified region. Um, so those paintings appeared, as I mentioned, on north and south walls. Um, this is a plan of um, such a cave shrine, and if you were to enter, you would see first on your left-hand side the victorious procession of Zhang Yichao, and then directly opposite on the right side, you would see the procession of his consort, Lady Song. And now I want to talk a little bit about the paintings that appear in the ceiling of the niche in the west wall of the cave. And we see that here. So we have a statue of Maitreya Buddha, so we have uh, donor images, uh, just below, and then uh, bodhisattva paintings on the other side. And the ceiling of the west wall niche is constructed in a fashion that we call a truncated pyramid. Uh, what this means is that there are four ceiling slopes that lean in toward one another, and they never come to a full point. So this doesn't form a true pyramid, but rather there's a flat portion at the top of the ceiling. And there are a number of paintings of various Buddhist deities on the west, um, north, south, and also the west ceiling slope. So the west ceiling slope is something that you can't really see in this photograph. Um, it's kind of on this side, just right in here. And if we take a close look at the paintings from the ceiling of the west wall niche, what we find is um, an intriguing combination of, again, the Tang Chinese and also the Tibetan painting styles. And the painting on the left is what we see on the uppermost part of the ceiling, the flat part of the ceiling in the west wall niche. And then on the right is the painting of a deity that we see in the west ceiling slope. That was the part that I mentioned was a little bit hard to see. Let me actually go back to the previous slide for a moment. So this thousand arm of Lokiteshvara painting appears here on the uppermost part of the ceiling. And then this deity is one of two that appear on the west ceiling slope the hardest area to see in the cave shrine. And so the presence, or I should say the continued presence of the Tibetan, the attenuated, elongated Tibetan painting style and also Tibetan style iconography in a cave shrine um, that purportedly commemorates uh, the reclamation of uh, Dunhuang by Zhang Yichao complicates our received knowledge um, about uh, the history of this region. And if we examine more closely the legacy of Zhang Yichao, what we see is that um, even though he reclaimed the uh, Hushi territories and returned the allegiance of that region to the Tang Central Court at Chang'an, um, the real picture is much more complicated. And we see evidence of this in um, what might be viewed as the distrust on the part of the central Chinese court of the Zhang clan. Um, after Zhang Yichao's defeat of the Tibetans in 848, um, he was compelled to send two envoys to Chang'an before receiving official recognition from the, Chang, from the Tang Dynasty court. Um, and the reason why he had to receive official recognition from the Tang court was because without it, he would not be able to rule Dunhuang in their name as the military governor of the Return to Allegiance Army. 
Not only did he have to send two envoys before finally receiving um, this official recognition, but he was also compelled um, his, I should say, his elder brother, uh, Zhang Yitan, was forced to stay in Chang'an, in the town capital, as a hostage in order to ensure the loyalty of the Zhang clan to the central uh, Tang Chinese court. After Zhang Yitan died in 867, Zhang Yichao had to take his brother's place, and then he then served as um, more or less uh, a um, hostage to the Tang Chinese court in order to once again ensure the loyalty of his clan. And then another descendant, Zhang Huashan, was appointed in his successor. And in a more severe uh, reprisal of the events just a decade earlier, Zhang Huashan had to send four envoys to the Tang Chinese court um, over a period of two decades, from the 860s to the 880s, before finally receiving the official recognition um, in order to rule Dunhuang in the name of the Tang Chinese court. So it's perhaps due to the power struggle between the Tang court and the Guizhen, as well as the distrust on the part of the Tang court that was directed toward the return to allegiance army, that the iconographic program placed special emphasis on the pictorial narrative of Zhang Yichao's conquest of the Tibetans. So the paintings on the north and south walls of Zhang Yichao's triumphal procession and Lady Sun's procession are very public and they're very easy to see um, when you enter the cave. Um, however, the insertion of pictorial motifs, such as the Tibetan style bodhisattva that you see on the right, in the most difficult to see area of the cave shrine, um, suggests that, um, suggests the um, complexity um, of the situation and also confirms the continued presence of Tibetan uh, iconographic, um, artistic, and other norms, um, even in the return to allegiance army period. And scholars now acknowledge that even after the uh, reclaiming of uh, Dunhuang by the Return to Allegiance Army, uh, Tibetan linguistic, cultural, and artistic norms continue to circulate um, in the Gansu Corridor even after the establishment of the Gui Yichun. And Zhang Yichao was known to have been a devout Buddhist. And he was someone who had been raised entirely in the multicultural environment of the Tibetan occupation of Dunhuang. So he had never known anything but Tibetan rule. And we know that he not only copied out Chinese sutras in order to um, accrue merit, um, but he copied out Tibetan Buddhist texts as well, and he even took a Tibetan name. Even well after the fall of the Tibetan Empire and the beginnings of the Return to Allegiance Army, the Tibetan language and writing system um, continued to be used in Dunhuang even by non-Tibetans. Um, so Tibetan uh, was used, in fact, as a lingua franca well into the 10th century as a medium of written communication um, because it was a syllabary, so it could be adapted easily by non-Chinese peoples in order to write their own languages. And other evidence of the multiculturalism of the region um, lies in uh, manuscripts from Dunhuang, and this is a copy of the Lankavatar Sutra. And this was written in Tibetan as well as Chinese. And given the um, directional orientation of Tibetan and Chinese, um, Tibetan, of course, which is written from left to right, top to bottom, and Chinese, which is written top to bottom, right to left, the manuscript has to be turned in different ways in order to read either the Chinese or Tibetan script. And I should also point out that um, this dates into the Guizhen period. So again, it gives evidence of continued use of Tibetan even after the fall of the Tibetan Empire. And the fact that this manuscript is a Lankavatara Sutra um, is actually quite interesting because there have also been studies done into evidence for a, um, the practice of Tibetan Zen at Dunhuang, uh, which is something that uh, was um, previously unknown. Um, but anyway, going back to this particular manuscript, so we can see that there is um, text written in red as well as in black. And the Tibetan script is written in red, and the Chinese characters are written in black. And um, this is a manuscript uh, which uh, takes the form of an accordion folded book and it actually combines two manuscript formats, uh, one of which is the Chinese hand scroll which is horizontally oriented and read from right to left and the other which is the Indian poti and we see an example of that in the lower right. And this is a book format in which um, index scripts were written um, from left to right and top to bottom. And so basically, in order to read either script, the manuscript would have to be manipulated in different ways. So in order to read the original, uh, the original sutra that was uh, written in Tibetan, yes, that was written in Tibetan, you would actually have to turn this to the right 
and in order to be able to read the script that was written from left to right, um, thus making it look more like an Indian poti. And this is a form that was also used in Tibet. You'll also notice the dot in the center, and this is actually non-functioning. Um, so originally, um, in the Indian poti format, holes were punched in visual um, leaves in order to allow a string to be strung through them in order to keep the pages of the manuscript together. In order to be the Chinese script, the manuscript would be oriented the way that it is now, um, allowing our readers to read the Chinese commentary um, from right to left in the Chinese fashion. Um, even well into the post event period in the Guichun period, the mandala of, mandala of Igwe Bodhisattvas continued to appear in mural paintings, and now under the patronage of the second family to rule under the return to religious army, which was the Cao clan. And I'm showing you two paintings from Yulin Cave 20, uh, which were patronized by uh, Cao Yan Lu and his wife, whose surname was Yin. And once again, we have the mandala of Igwe Bodhisattvas. Now we have two examples. And uh, with the central deity, the Buddha painted in the Tang Chinese style and also in the Tibetan style on the right. And uh, what is interesting is that not only do we have continued interest in the Mandala of Igre Bodhisattvas, um, the symbol of the Tibetan Imperium, as well as of treaty negotiations between the Chinese and Tibetans, continuing into the post-Tibetan period, but the inscription accompanying both Buddhas identifies them as Vairokshana Buddha, even they, though they look very different from one another. And also, there are um, attendant Bodhisattvas um, in the center that taken all together would comprise a set of eight deities that we typically see in the esoteric Buddhist mandala. So it's almost as if the two paintings are connected not only by style, but also by the central, um, the central uh, attendant deities that we see here. And this shows you how the paintings were um, placed vis-a-vis one another. So there's a large central painting of the medicine Buddha, and then the mandalas uh, were placed on either side. Uh, so, in closing, uh, what I want to note is that uh, paying attention to the visual culture of mandalas at Dunhuang um, gives us deeper insight into the multicultural uh, and multilingual um, context of Dunhuang, both during Tibetan and the post-Tibetan period. And by studying mandalas from this perspective, um, this gives us insight into uh, the dialogue uh, between the Tibetans and the Chinese. And um, this is evident in a number of different forms. First of all, in iconographic templates um, and also manuscripts, um, as well as inscriptions brushed on paintings. <coughs> And by understanding the continued interactions between the Tibetan and between the Tibetans and the Chinese during the Tibetan and post-Tibetan periods, um, we can understand that the purposeful juxtaposition between um, two um, artistic styles as well as the two languages um, um, speaks volumes. And at the same time, this also complicates the standard historical narrative regarding the return of Dunhuang to Tang China following the expulsion of the Tibetans in the ninth century. Thank you.